Good day for the stock market for a change. We have Alex Marlowe, Breitbart editor-in-chief and co-author of Breitbart Business Digest, and John Carney, Breitbart economics and finance editor and co-author of Breitbart Business Digest. Gentlemen, welcome back. So, fellas, I was reading an interesting piece you wrote that disinflation may be over and that we might have a second round, a second bout of uh, inflation. Now, let me just add... I'm going to go to you, John Carney, first on this. Get ready. Get set. There's a lot of indicators. You've got big decline in the growth of M2, commodity prices falling quite a bit in some cases. Um, the dollar is very strong. So you have these sort of market-based leading indicators of future inflation that are saying inflation's coming down. But you all are not so sure. Tell us about it, please. That's right. If you look at uh, markers of underlying inflation, such as the Cleveland Fed's median CPI, what you see is things are getting actually worse. There's more inflation built up in the system. Yes, we're seeing some commodities come down, partly because global demand is falling, because Europe is falling into a deep recession. China keeps locking down, so that brings down the price of oil. The housing market is slowing, so that brings down the price of lumber. But those things are not leading indicators of where inflation is going. Inflation has spread throughout the economy. It's very big moving into services now. That's not going to show up on any commodities uh, chart. And so what we're, what we are seeing is in median CPI, median PCE, all of these measures of sort of the middle of where inflation is going, that is very predictive. That's telling us to expect more inflation in the future, not less. You know, Alex, I'm looking here at the inflation now casting from the Cleveland Fed, which is kind of the equivalent of the Atlanta Fed's GDP tracker. And they're actually showing a bump up, another bump up of inflation, uh, which would bolster what John was just saying. Uh, for September, they're looking for 0 0.3 on the CPI, 0 0.5 on the core CPI, so that's a pretty big number. And that would leave you with 8.2% year on year and 6.6% uh, for the core. So that's actually a little pickup. That would be the second month of pickup. Uh, so is that a leading indicator? I mean, it's interesting. That's this now casting, which is relatively new stuff, Alex. What you make of it? Yeah, this is what Carney and I have been looking at, and we think this is the number that is the greatest predictor of whether or not more inflation is coming. And traditionally, the Cleveland Fed median CPI is the number, I think, that is the biggest indicator, and that's sending a clear sign here, Larry. And I'll tell you, if you look at the Fed's move to only raise interest rates 75 basis points and how that did not have any immediate effect on infl—inflation. if you look at the policies of the Biden administration, which are blatantly inflationary, everything they're doing, we just talked about these... Uh, the, this relief, which is really a debt transfer for student loans. We talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, which didn't reduce inflation. It's really all pandering to woke people who want to expand the green climate agenda. Every bit of it is inflationary. So we buy into it. We think that Cleveland Fed number is the one to look at right now. You know, John, it's interesting, uh, going back to the student loan business, you know, let's say it's $500 billion. That's a lot of money to put back into the stream. Um, the Green New Deal tax credits came to, what, $400 billion in that bill? That's going into the spending stream. And then before that, you had the uh, Silicon Valley uh, chips giveaway, which was close to $300 billion. Uh, all that stuff. So M2, it's interesting to me, M2 is falling while budget spending and deficits were coming down temporarily as some of the emergency stuff is running off. But now, John, one has to wonder, with all this new spending coming online, maybe you're going to see a pickup of M2, and it might be reflected that liquidity into the commodity markets as well. I think that's right. If you add up all those numbers, we're over a trillion dollars being pushed back into the system. I talked to a young person who, in his 20s, and he said, oh, this is great. I'll be able to afford a bigger apartment because I'll have more money for rent. Mm -hmm. And I said... Buddy, everybody got that money. That means the price of those apartments that you were looking to move into is going up. This is a hugely inflationary move. And what's more, I think it spells trouble for the future. Because if we have an administration willing to spend like crazy right now with almost 9% inflation, 
what does that tell you about the future? It means they're not going to slow down spending at all. They're going to keep it up going, you know, because remember, three years from now, we're, two years from now, we have another election coming up, and Biden's going to spend it, try to spend his way into re-election. Yeah, you know, Alex, just to switch gears slightly, so last night they passed this continuing resolution to keep the government open, heaven forbid. But the thing only runs through the middle of December. So think about this, Alex. You might have a Republican takeover of the Congress, but the Democrat lame duck will be there, and they will try to spend in two weeks, and believe me, <laughs> they could do it. They will try to spend every imaginable progressive wish list item under the sun. And that's why, I mean, I was begging Republican senators not to vote for the CR. I could care less about the government staying open because that's all phony baloney. All the important stuff is paid out anyway. But the CR does it, it ends in mid-December. So you're going to give these progressive Democrats another couple of weeks to just spend their tuckuses off. I mean, that's really a problem. It is, and especially in the run-up to the election where you're seeing Biden, the only people who are still with him are that left-wing base. And it seems like he's sending every indication he's not trying to reach across the aisle. He's not trying to look at uh, normal Americans, average citizens. He's really looking more towards Brussels and Davos for where he's getting his values right now because that's where his staff is. That's where his advisors are. That's what they believe in. And there's no indication at all he's going to do anything to rein in spending because politically he thinks that's a better strategy. He just thinks it's game on. And to be honest, Larry, we've all become accustomed to having the government run out of money and having them dip into the piggy bank and put more on the credit card and put more on the taxpayers. And it is an outrage that we've all accepted as a, as a society at this point. You know, John, uh, just thinking and listening to Alex about Davos and Brussels, two of my least favorite places or organizations, you know, the world government. What a wonderful idea, world government. So... Uh, you probably read this, both of you. John Kerry and Al Gore attacking my pal David Malpass, who runs president of the World Bank. And, um, you know, this is right out of the Davos playbook. This is right out of the Green New Deal playbook. They want to turn the World Bank into essentially a global climate bank, John Carney, right? That's what they want. Just throw this money, throw them at windmills, just like we're doing here at home, do it worldwide. Uh, even though you've got large chunks of the world economy that's in deep trouble and needs help for any uh, energy whatsoever, much less changing all their systems. How about that? World government, World Bank, Climate Bank, just spend money on all this stuff. Look what a great job it's done, John Carney. Hasn't it, has it boosted our economy or has it driven up prices? I ask you. It's, it's definitely driven up prices. And look, I, I have to say, I really admire David Malpass's resistance to allowing yes. the World Bank to become a climate bank. This is crazy what they want to do. And I'm really, I think he's heroically fighting back against this. And of course they were going to come after him. He knew that, and yet he did it anyway. So good on him. I think we need more people like David Malpass. I'm very worried about trying to turn every banking agency in the United States into a green bank. And also every agency in the United States into a bank. So they're creating climate banks left and right. It's They're going to hurt the economy. They're going to hurt productivity. They're going to bury us in regulation, Larry. And I think this is a front that, where we really have to stop them. We, they cannot convert the financial system of the globe into a Green New Deal. Right. That's what it is. Alex, give you the last word. We only got about 25 seconds. But you know what? Every government agency now has one of these ESG coordinators. In fact, the latest one for the control of the currency went to college uh, in China. So, you know, big communist uh, link to the Communist Party of China. The Congress didn't authorize these ESG coordinators. This is a new thing. The Bidens are just doing this. So this is your, you know, global climate bank writ large. Well, China's prioritizing growth over the green economy stuff. They're still building coal-fired power plants, which are the biggest polluters imaginable. And we're making things much more difficult on the middle and working classes right now in, because we're making energy very expensive. And this does come from those European super state concepts that we participate in, unfortunately. Yep. Let's hear it for Davos. All right, gentlemen, Alex Marlowe and John Carty from Breitbart, we appreciate it very much.